Welcome and thank you for joining us for this webinar on new tricks, logistics, and ethics of expanding the donor pool with hepatitis B and hepatitis C by Remic Organs. This webinar is co-sponsored by the AST Transplant Pharmacy Community of Practice and the Infectious Disease Community of Practice. Before we begin the main presentation, we have a few housekeeping notes to help you engage with today's discussion. There, there is currently a leadership poll displayed on your screen. Please take a moment to answer this question while we finish the remaining announcements. This webinar is being recorded and the archive will be available on the TX Farm COP and the ID COP hub next week. Please note that your lines have been muted so that only the presenters can be heard for the archived recording. If you have a question for our panelists during the webinar, we encourage you to participate by using the Q&A section in the Zoom webinar panel to submit your questions for consideration. Please note that any questions submitted in the via chat section may be missed during the presentation. If there are questions that we do not have time for, we will either answer them individually offline or we will post the full question with the answer on the hub following the webinar. And finally, when you log off at the conclusion of today's webinar, you will see a link to a short survey to complete. Please fill out the survey to help us keep our content current and engaging. I will now turn the session over to our moderators, Drs. Aruna Subramanian and Dr. Hannah Ropo, to begin our presentation. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or early afternoon for us on the West Coast. My name is Hannah Ropo, and I'm a pharmacist at OHSU Hospital in Oregon. I'm happy to be able to present to you our initial two speakers that will be presenting on hepatitis C. We have Dr. Ann Woolley, who is a physician and clinical researcher in the Infectious Disease Division at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. Her work focuses on innovation in the care of solid organ and bone marrow transplant recipients with infectious disease complications. Dr. Woolley is the Associate Clinical Director of Solid Organ Transplant Infectious Diseases at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. She's an affiliated scientist at the Broad Institute and Associate Medical Director for the New England Donor Services. Dr. Idris Kubu is a solid organ transplant pharmacist at Virginia Commonwealth University Health System. His interest includes expanding the donor pool with viremic donors, and he was a contributing author to the DAPR study. And I'll now hand it over to Aruna, who will be um, introducing our other two speakers. Hi, I'm Dr. Aruna Subramanian. Do, I do transplant infectious disease at Stanford University. And I'm very happy to welcome you all on behalf of the ID community of practice. I'm chair, the current chair of the executive committee of the ID community of practice. And I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our third and fourth speakers today, who will be speaking on hepatitis B. Dr. Emily Eichenberger completed her medical residency at New York Presbyterian and went on to be chief medical resident at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. After that, she completed her infectious disease fellowship where she trained on the transplant infectious disease T32 training grant. And now she's faculty at Emory University where she's currently an assistant professor of medicine practicing transplant infectious disease and has an interest in donor-derived infections. Finally, we have Dr. Tiffany Kaiser, who's currently an associate professor of medicine in the Division of Digestive Disease and an adjunct professor at the College of Pharmacy at the University of Cincinnati. She practices as a transplant clinical pharmacist, director of transplant quality program, and is the assistant director of the PGY2 transplant residency program. So we look forward to hearing all our wonderful speakers today, and I'll hand it over to Dr. Ann Woolley. Thank you so much. And thank you all for being here today as we, I will start us off um, as the first of our two speakers on hepatitis C. I do not have any disclosures. So I know many of us are wondering why still in 2023, we're talking about how can we safely accept hep C positive donor organs. But what we'll talk about today, my colleague and I, who will be presenting after me, is less about the why. We're all well aware of the supply um, issues and the demand that's there. We all know about the issues with organ utilization of hep C positive donors and how that fortunately has really developed in the past five years and grown that more and more centers are accepting this for their patients. We'll talk less about the who. Is it a case that certain patients should be eligible for these? Does it depend on the graph quality? 
quality, the recipient waitlist urgency and the organ type. But we do want to focus a bit on the how and the why not. What about the adverse events? Do we have enough long-term outcome data? Does, what can we still do to help to optimize these protocols to minimize rejection and extra hepatic complications? And how should we do this? Which medication? And then what I will focus on, when should we be starting treatment for our donor, our recipients who receive hep C positive and NAP positive organs? And then my colleague will then talk next about for how long should these treatments um, be given to our recipients. So we don't need to talk about why not to do this because we all well know that we should be doing this with hep C and we know many of the reasons why. One of the things that has been conflicting when we look back to when we used to do this in the early 2000s are how conflicting the reports are regarding whether graft outcomes and patient survival were actually worse among recipients of hep C positive donor organs in terms of allograft vasculopathy, nephropathy. And that's what we really need to tease out and know now in our current era, because we know that the availability of direct acting antivirals for hepatitis C made the inconceivable possible. We could now do this again in a safe way with pangenotypic regimens that were well tolerated with limited drug to drug interactions. We know we're not reinventing the wheel here. We do this, we have a precedent for donor derived infections with CMV and the difference being that CMV is not curable and that we know and we willingly accept organs that we know perhaps may put our recipients at risk for non-infectious complications down the road if we're not able to manage the hep C. So we have to think about many things in terms of how we should go about accepting hep C infected donor organs. Colleagues here from uh, in 2020 published this wonderful editorial in which they really broke this down into eight considerations in terms of the consent, the ethics of this, the insurance of getting the medications covered, the risk of transmission. But again, what we want to talk about today is what is the optimal initiation timing for direct acting antivirals and how does this impact short term and long term outcomes. So let's get to this. What is the optimal timing of DAA initiation treatment? Well, let's look to our societies to see what they recommend. So we know that the Liver Society and the IDSA Hep C guidelines are really where we go for so much of our uh, knowledge for this and how to direct us. What do they say? Well, this is back in 2019 where they recommended that we should initiate direct acting um, antiviral therapy for Hep C negative recipients from Hep C viremic donors prophylactically or preemptively or reactively after documentation. They did not really come down hard on one way or the other. Part of that was because of the fact that we didn't want to exclude centers from being able to do this if they could not provide the medication at the time right at the initiation of transplant. So, but the recommendation was to undertake DAA therapy as early as clinically possible. And it was a rating at 2B for that early treatment with pangenotypic regimen was recommended when the patient was clinically stable. Fortunately, now in the next three to four years, this has been updated to be a bit stronger to say that it should be started as early as possible in order to minimize the duration of hep C viremia in the recipient, since we believe and we have some data that I will show you that perhaps the duration of viremia in our recipients can lead to some non-hepatic complications. And the recommendation became a bit stronger. Prophylactic preemptive treatment with a pangenotypic direct acting antiretroviral, um, uh, direct acting antiviral regimen is recommended. So let's start back to our first two trials that really helped to open this up and started initiation of this study in 2016 and published in 2017 and 2018, the Thinker trial and the Expander trial. The two first trials on using hep C mismatch organs from at Penn and at Hopkins. And what's interesting is right from the beginning, they use a different approach. The Thinker trial did a reactive treatment approach waiting for their recipients to become viremic and have hep C virus to then treat, whereas the expanded trial did a preemptive or prophylactic treatment arm where they started treatment right away. There were small numbers. We didn't see any differences. Both had excellent outcomes. 
But then we had our colleagues at Vanderbilt who really led the way in terms of showing how this can be done in our heart transplant recipients, not done under a clinical trial, more as real world data. They initiated treatment when the patients were nearing discharge. And for those that were discharged in a reasonable period of time after transplant, they started their um, treatment for hep C in the outpatient setting. And as you can see in the red box, the median number of days from transplant to when treatment was started was 55 days for 52 of their recipients, compared to 93 days for those three recipients. And overall, they did very well. There were no treatment failures, but three patients developed acute pancreatitis at a mean of 48 days post heart transplant before initiation of hep C treatment. Did this have anything to do with the hep C viremia? Then our colleagues at Penn did a similar study looking at this, they're called their USHER trial in heart transplant recipients. And they saw what was interesting in one of their patients that they waited until day three before starting treatment initiation. So very soon after transplant and already their recipient had an exceedingly high viral load of 40 million international units per ml. Then our study here at the Brigham, we were trying to see, could we block viral replication in the recipient using a preemptive shortened four-week treatment course of Savasavir or Valpadisvir? And we wanted to see this not only in terms of whether or not our patients could achieve sustained virologic response 12 weeks after treatment completion, but whether or not we also could achieve graft survival, since that's what we all care about most in the transplant community. We published on our initial phase one of our study, where all of our uh, patients that have been enrolled to date um, in 2019 met the primary outcome. But what we saw with this, which I think is very telling and very informative when we think about studies going forward, is panel A that I want to draw your attention to here, where the recipient initial baseline hep C viral load was directly proportional to what the donor hep C viral load was meaning that if we had a quantitative viral load in the donor, we would then know how low the, or high the recipient initial uh, viral load would be and therefore could cater treatment to that rather than just doing a reactive approach and waiting until seeing when or if our transplant recipients developed hep C. Though we had excellent outcomes in this phase of our study, what we did see was that we saw higher or worsening PGD, despite no worsening PGD grades at 72 hours in our lung transplant cohort, the odds of having acute cellular rejection requiring treatment in the non-hep C lung cohort was smaller than that of the hep C lung cohort. It was no high grade of cellular rejection and it wasn't statistically significant, but the numbers were small. And our concern was why were we seeing this signal? Is it something to do with the graph themselves? This was also seen and our colleagues in, from NYU that looked at this in their heart transplant recipients, and they saw that also, though they started their treatment not as preemptive or prophylactically, but very early on after transplant at a mean period of 7.2 days, that they also saw an increased rate of acute cellular rejection in their transplant recipients that received organs from hep C NAP positive donors. And they also then looked at it to see when the time period was in terms of the recipient's level of viremia and whether or not that had anything to do with this. And so we've now had some concern. Are we seeing an increased risk of acute cellular rejection? And what will this mean with longer term outcomes? And then our colleagues in Toronto looked at this and not only did direct acting antiviral treatment, but also used ex vivo lung perfusion and UVC perfusator radiation to try to reduce the concentration of hep C RNA and infectivity. Their primary point again was composite of survival and hep C free status at six months post transplant. It's important to highlight this study because this was the first study in our thoracic organ transplants where we saw hep C relapse. So two of their patients, though they started treatment very soon after, around the two week mark or so, after they had their received the transplant, the two did have hep C relapse. They ended up getting treated fine and had no issues going forward. But would this have been different if treatment had been started right away? And were there any other non-hepatic complications that could have been incurred by those recipients by having this relapse? So what should the approach be to the timing of initiation and the type of treatment regimen in our transplant recipients from hep C viremic donors? Because what we have to think about is not just how do we do this under a trial setting, but how do we make this more generalizable? Because what we all care about is how do we further increase organ utilization of organs that are otherwise medically suitable for transplant? 
I would argue that the reason to doing reactive or delayed treatment really is because of lack of insurance coverage or cost of the medication. We know that with preemptive treatment, and as my colleague will, will speak about shortly, it allows us to do a shortened direct acting antiviral um, treatment course. It minimizes hep C replication in the recipient, and it can prevent extrahepatic adverse events and potentially also rejection. So thank you for this part. I'm going to pass it over to my colleague, but I really think what we need to think about here is, are we seeing an increased risk of acute cellular rejection in our hep C cohorts? And if so, why and how can we change that? And really thinking about next steps in terms of what should be the treatment duration and continuing to look at longer term outcomes. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Wooley, for laying a, a very strong foundation for the remainder of this talk. Uh, here are my disclosures and also where use of medications will be discussed. Uh, so Dr. Wooley talked about the uh, complications that, that could be uh, derived from um, hep C viremia. And, um, and use, utilizing a prophylactic approach in this patient population may be the optimal strategy uh, compared to the transmitter and treat approach because we can significantly avoid some of those uh, hepatic and non-hepatic complications. Um, in our, our center, uh, one of the rationales that we, uh, that we thought about in deriving a, an ultra short prophylactic strategy, specifically in kidney transplantation, was that the inoculum of the virus with a, with a kidney might be small and could be sterilized uh, with a, prophylact a perioperative prophylactic approach. And uh, as Dr. Woolley mentioned with the expanded trial uh, from Hopkins, um, it suggested that at post-op day one, the majority of these patients who received the hep, hep C viremic uh, transplant had an undetectable virus, uh, which perhaps could indicate that, uh, again, the inoculum of the, of, of the virus um, uh, may be small and could be sterilized with prophylaxis. Um, and again, it's important to note that in the expanded trial, this patient received a pre-transplant dose of uh, a DA agent to prevent transmission of hep C. Also, as we know, the advent of uh, the uh, pangenotypic agents allows for uh, high cure rates and have improved safety profile, which again, allows us to avoid waiting for genotyping prior to transplant, which significantly reduce the uh, code ischemic time and also can minimize uh, discard rates uh, of, of the, of the uh, donor organ. Uh, specifically with our approach, uh, we utilize sulfosivir at the time of conception of our experience, uh, that was the only fixed dose pangenotypic DAA that was uh, available at the time of our study conception. Um, and we felt that a short course of sulfosivir was, was unlikely to cause any uh, toxicity. And the pharmacokinetic profile of sulfosivir suggests that it has a, a prolonged half-life and, and a prolonged area under the cough in patients who have kidney failure, which may suggest that perhaps that the, the effect of this medication may last longer um, in this patient population. And again, a prophylactic strategy may, uh, and prevention of viremia could avoid the uh, uh, hepatic and non-hepatic complications that may uh, result from, um, from, from viremia. Our study, the DAPR study, was a, an adaptive uh, study design where we, um, uh, on that informed concern, uh, patients who had no living donors or had um, were age greater than 60 and had an expected wait time of two years, uh, two years or, or, or more, or patients within the ages of 18 and, and, and 60 with at least uh, a comorbidity of diabetes, coronary artery disease, peripheral vascular disease, or having cerebral vascular disease, um, were um, consented to receive um, a, a a pangenotypic DAA in an adaptive fashion. So the first proof of concept in our experience was providing these patients with two doses of sulfosivir with the first dose given prior to transplant and the second dose given by on, on post of day one. Um, this uh, strategy was supported by the uh, pharmacy department who provided us with the medications to help support this initial pilot uh, phase of, of our experience. Um, the adaptive design of the study allowed us for us to, you know, change our, 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 our protocol uh, based off of the outcomes that we found from this initial pilot phase. Uh, based on the results of the, from, from the pilot phase, we then extended the duration of prophylaxis from two doses uh, to four doses, and then further expanded to seven doses, which is our current standard of care. Um, and um, 
after the release of the uh, experience from, the, 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 from Toronto, which I'm going to talk a lot about in a little bit, uh, some of these patients also received azetamibe. Uh, and uh, based on our experience, we do not see any significant difference in patients who receive sulfosibib or patisbury alone versus those who receive sulfosibib or patisbury in combination with azetamibe. Patients were included if they had a presence of any significant chronic liver disease or had a PR variant of 20% or retransplant patients. So in our first pilot phase of this study where patients received uh, two doses of um, uh, supposedly of Patisbury, we had a transmission rate of about 30%. And we extended the duration of prophylaxis from, uh, from two doses to four doses. We saw a decrease in transmission rate from 30% uh, to about 7.5%. And in our current standard of care of seven doses of, uh, of sulfosibib of Velpatisbury, with the first dose given prior to transplants, we currently have a transmission rate of about 5.6% uh, uh, in uh, over 160 uh, kidney transplant patients. Again, about 18% of these patients in the seven-dose protocol also received um, uh, azetamide. But again, we did not notice any difference in rates of transmission in patients who uh, received azetamide versus those who did not receive azetamide. So we reverted to using just a possible of Patisbury for seven doses uh, for prophylaxis. So in our cumulative experience, we found a transmission rate of about 7% uh, cumulatively in over 200 kidney transplants. And all patients who uh, developed viremia uh, with this strategy responded to treatment. In the uh, colleagues in Toronto uh, also looked at an ultra short prophylactic approach. Uh, in this study, they use um, Maverick as their uh, uh, prophylactic DAA in combination with azetamide. And um, they, inclu uh, they, they included not just kidney transplant patients, but also included lung and heart transplant patients in the study. Their primary outcome was an undetectable viral load at 12 weeks after transplantation. And um, out of the 30 patients that were included in the study, 11 uh, of them were kidney transplant patients. Again, they received with caprovir and pibentrisvir uh, or uh, maverick uh, plus azetamide with the first dose given prior to transplants and continued daily for a total of eight doses. And all patients uh, in their cohort uh, uh, had 100 met their primary outcome, which was an undetectable viral load at 12 weeks after transplant. So specifically our protocol at BCU, uh, HCV negative kidney transplant candidates that meet criteria are consented and listed for a HCV positive uh, uh, donor kidney. Uh, at the time of transplants, this patient received a, uh, a dose of sulfosibib of Elpatisvir prior to transplants and continued for uh, additional six days after transplant for a total of seven doses. Our current protocol is supported by the transplant center. So the initial doses during the inpatient admission is supplied by the inpatient pharmacy. Our immunosuppression for all these patients is consistent with all our non-HCV uh, positive to, uh, negative recipients with induction with antithamocyglobulin and uh, triple drug maintenance immunosuppression with tacrolimus, mycophenolate, and steroids. And then at the time of this shot, our average length of stay for our kidney transplant patients is approximately three to four days. Um, and uh, at the time of discharge, the subsequent doses to complete the seven days of uh, prophylaxis is dispensed by our discharge pharmacy and an invoice is built to our transplant business operations manager. Uh, and the post trans in the, in the clinic setting, uh, HCV viral load is checked on post of the seven, uh, 14, 21, and 90 days post transplants. And development of viremia, which is confirmed by two consecutively positive RNA necessitates a consult to uh, one of our hepatologists for treatment with a 12-week course of, uh, of, uh, of uh, DAA based off, based off of the patient's insurance. And ACV resistance testing is empirically obtained at the time of uh, 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 confirmation of viremia. So um, establishment of our program was really a multidisciplinary approach. Again, we received support from uh, pharmacy administration to allow us to begin the initial pilot phase of the study. Uh, we also received funding from uh, the manufacturer uh, for us to extend from two doses from the initial conception of the study to four doses. And so once we were able to prove that uh, 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 proof of concept, we were able to present the data to the transplant surgery administrators 
uh, to get buy-in from the administrators to continue to uh, provide this uh, in innovative approach to our kidney transplant patients. Uh, this patient is certainly followed by our transplant nephro uh, nephrologist and certainly the, uh, our transplant uh, specialty pharmacy programs who, uh, you know, uh, who uh, uh, assist with uh, the preauthorizations and the dispensing aspect of things, and specifically in patients uh, who uh, have breakthrough viremia. Again, like I mentioned earlier, in patients who uh, who need additional to complete the uh, food seven days of prophylaxis, uh, if they need additional doses at the time of discharge, the additional doses are dispensed by a discharge pharmacy. And if patients in, who develop viremia, these patients are followed by transplant hepatologists or infectious disease colleagues. So what are some of the things that we've learned in our approach? One of the things that we've learned is that the pre-transplant dose of, uh, of DA is extremely important. About 33% of patients who developed uh, breakthrough viremia in our cohort missed the pre-transplant dose. Uh, so again, that's extremely essential to ensure that uh, these patients receive that pre-transplant dose of, uh, of the antiviral agent. Uh, we current we are currently and politically test for resistance uh, resistance prior to initiation of uh, of, uh, of of treatment, and because about fifty percent of patients with uh, with uh, with uh, uh, viremia also developed NS5 resistance, and we're currently retrospectively looking at this data to see if this is donor derived um, re resistance or if if it, the resistance was developed due to a drug exposure with the use of sulfosamide patisvir as a prophylactic strategy. Initially, for our initial cohort of patients, patients who developed uh, viremia were also treated with sulfosamide valpatisvir, and we initially encountered patients who, who did not respond to treatment. Uh, so we currently use, uh, at least attempt to use, uh, a different agent from sulfosamide valpatisvir as treatment uh, in patients who, who uh, develop uh, viremia. Based off of the results of, uh, of the failed study from Toronto, who used glucoprovera preventus or Maveret, uh, it may suggest that Maveret may be, uh, may be pharmacologically more suitable for an ultra short uh, duration prophylaxis, given the fact that the data from the Toronto study, uh, they had 0% uh, transmission rates, but also pharmacokinetically, sulfosborer is a prodrug that requires conversion to its active uh, metabolite. And perhaps Maverick that isn't a prodrug may be a more suitable uh, agent for ultra short duration prophylaxis. Some of the other things to so perhaps you know, watch out for uh, certainly drug drug interact interactions. A, a small cohort of patients who uh, had breakthrough viremia also received uh, proton, pump in pro proton pump inhibitors. So it's important to con uh, consult with a transplant pharmacist in these patients or uh, to ensure that there's avoidance of drug drug interactions that may put patients at risk for a uh, breakthrough viremia. So the results uh, um, from, from, from our uh, experience, um, future directions, we, um, as we're curious to see what the ex extended uh, uh, experience from the fourth study will look like with additional patients. So the initial cohort uh, presented 30 patients. We're, I'm curious to, to know if uh, perhaps with additional patients, if their rates of viremia remains at 0%. There's currently an, um, a, a uh, future randomized motor center study uh, that's going to be looking at two weeks of sulfosamide valpatisvir versus uh, uh, prophylactically versus a transmit and treat approach. And the results of this study will certainly be more telling to know if, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, to look at the differences between the prophylactic approach versus the tra uh, transmit and treat approach. And one of the, uh, the, the limitations for transplant centers to adopt a prophylactic approach is oftentimes who pays for uh, these medications in the inpatient setting. And I think in the future, it will be perhaps beneficial to have the insurance companies to uh, have a carved out payment for uh, these um, uh, inpatient use of this antiviral agent when used prophylactically, and perhaps would allow more transplant centers to, uh, you know, to consider this innovative approach and provide these types of therapy for transplant patients. Now, I'll pass it over to Dr. Eichenberg uh, to discuss uh, hepatitis B uh, in transplant patients. All right, thank you very much. So I have no relevant financial relationships to disclose, but I will be talking about the off-label use of medications and therapeutics. So as we're all aware, 
there's a global shortage of organs and we're constantly looking for ways to safely expand the donor pool. And as we just heard, transplantation of organs from hepatitis C positive donors into hepatitis C negative recipients is safe and effective. But what about transplanting organs from hepatitis B positive donors? Is that safe? So hepatitis B is a double-stranded DNA virus. There's approximately 250 million hepatitis B virus carriers in the world, and about 2.2 million people in the United States living with chronic hepatitis B. We know that vaccination is effective at preventing infection and that hepatitis B is treatable, but unlike hep C, it's not curable. Now there are available treatments for hepatitis B that are safe and effective at controlling this virus, and they're actually quite well tolerated. And this includes tenofovir and entecovir. So what do we mean when we say transplanting hepatitis B positive organs? How do we actually assess the donor uh, hepatitis B virus status? So we obtain a variety of labs in the donor, including the HEP B surface antibody, HEP B core antibody, HEP B surface antigen, and HEP B virus NAT or nucleic acid amplification test. And so a donor who has a positive surface antibody, but a negative core antibody, negative surface antigen, and a negative NAT reflects a donor who's been vaccinated. And there's really no risk of transmitting the virus in the case of transplant because this donor is not infected. Donors who test positive for a hep B surface antibody and a hep B core antibody reflect donors with natural immunity, and there's really minimal risk of transmission except in liver, wherein the, um, the virus persists in the hepatocytes. Donors who have a positive core antibody, positive surface antigen, and a negative NAT reflect infected donors with a low level viremia and transmission risk is expected in these scenarios. Donors with a positive hep B core antibody, positive surface antigen, and a positive NAT reflect infected viremic donors, and there's a high transmission risk that is expected in transplant. Finally, you can have these scenarios wherein you have an isolated positive core antibody, and this can represent a variety of scenarios such as a false positive, prior cleared infection, or an occult infection. And so for the purposes of this presentation, I'm really going to be focusing on these two scenarios, wherein we have a donor with a positive surface antigen or a positive NAT reflecting an infected viremic donor, and you expect a transmission. So has this been done? And if so, what are the recipient outcomes? So most of the earlier data came out of China where hep B is more prevalent. And these groups reported on their experience transplanting livers and kidneys from hep B surface antigen positive donors into hep B negative recipients. And in each of these studies, the outcomes of the recipients receiving the hep B positive organs were favorable and not significantly different from those receiving organs from hep B negative donors. This practice slowly began to emerge in the United States about 12 to 15 years ago, primarily in the liver transplant population at first. And so a recently published study in AJT compared the utilization and post-transplant patient survival of recipients receiving hep B surface antigen positive livers to recipients of other extended criteria organs. And so using UNOS data from 2009 to 2021, they, they found that there were a total of 70 liver transplants from hep B surface antigen positive donors that have been transplanted. And 58 of the recipients were hep B negative, most of whom were non-immune. So how did these recipients do? So they compared the recipient survival of the hep B positive livers to a number of different groups, including recipients of hep C, NAT positive organs, DCD donor organs, extended criteria donor organs, and 40 to 60th percentile DRI organs. And in each of these comparisons, the survival of patients receiving the hep B positive livers was not significantly different at three years than any of these other comparator groups. So that's really promising data. So I'm just going to show you this figure again that I showed you a few minutes ago, which is pretty jarring. So if we look at the rate of utilized hep B surface antigen positive 
organs or livers in, in dark gray. And compared to the discarded uh, livers in light gray, you can see that approximately half of all of these livers were discarded. And so perhaps there's maybe some missed opportunities here. So we also have data on uh, Hep B NAP positive organ transplantation into zero negative recipients. And so this was a great study by Delman and colleagues published in Annals of Surgery not too long ago, where they described their experience transplanting livers and kidneys from Hep B viremic donors into zero negative recipients. And so they found similar graft and patient survival outcomes relative to HET B negative livers and kidney recipients. And so also with a median follow-up of a year, there were no HET B virus related complications. They also showed that the recipients of the HET B NAT positive kidneys had a significantly shorter time on the wait list and a significantly shorter time on dialysis relative to the recipients of the HET B NAT negative kidneys. But all in all, I'd say so far, this is extremely positive data for our recipients. So what is what about thoracic organs? What's the data there? So unfortunately, the literature is pretty sparse. And in November of 2019, back when I was a transplant ID fellow at Duke, Dr. Cameron Wolf came to me with the idea to look at thoracic organ utilization from Hep B positive donors. And so we queried the OPN database for all Hep B mismatched solid organ transplant episodes from 2017 to 2019, really to determine thoracic organ utilization from Hep B positive donors. And so during this time period, you can see there were quite a few kidney and liver transplants performed um, that were mismatched Hep, uh, Hep B positive to Hep B negative recipients but there were only 14 hearts and five lungs used during this time period. So despite this really reassuring data that we're seeing in the abdominal transplant realm, we really aren't using the thoracic organs nearly as much as we could or should, one might argue. And so what I to convey to you today and so there are certainly a few ways to safely proceed with transplanting an organ from a Hep B positive donor into a Hep B negative recipient. And so here's one such way. So step one would be to obtain labs at the time of transplant. So in the donor obtaining Hep B DNA PCR along with the, the labs we discussed earlier, and in the recipient, you should obtain a Hep B DNA PCR, a Hep B surface antigen, a Hep B core antibodies, and a Hep B surface antibody titer. The next step is to determine whether you need to immunize this recipient. So a surface antibody titer of less than 10 reflects a non-immune recipient, and they should be started right away with a double dose Hep B vaccine or Hep Lasav series. For recipients with a surface antibody titer between 10 and 100, that reflects low level immunity and they should receive a double dose Hep B vaccine at the time of transplant. And for those recipients with a surface antibody titer of over 100, they're immune and they don't require a vaccine. The third and final step is treatment. And so you should commence antiviral treatment with either tenofovir or entecovir, depending on uh, the patient's insurance, the kidney function, hospital formulary, et cetera. And then some institutions will add on a five-day course of HBIG or hepatitis B immunoglobulin starting from post-op day zero to post-op day four uh, for added safety. Um, but at this time, I'm going to transition it over to Tiffany to talk a little bit more about clinical practice considerations. Thanks, Emily. As can be expected with the limited data and lack of consensus guideline, practice strategies for managing recipients of hepatitis B viremic organs are quite heterogeneous, variable across organ types as well as transplant centers, and often leave practitioners with more questions than answers. 
For the final section of the webinar, I was asked and I'm going to highlight some important practice considerations relating to transplanting discordant or Hep B NAT positive donors into negative recipients, including education, team consensus, appropriate informed consent, and recipient management. Providing hepatitis B education is essential, and I believe the foundation for success. I like to say this education should be provided in a global manner, right? It has to apply to the whole, so anyone and everyone. The education provided should be comprehensive. What's Hep B? How is it transmitted? How is it prevented? How can we treat it? But really, what does it mean in terms of the setting of transplantation? It has to be delivered to meet the level of the learner. What is provided to the patient likely differs what is provided to a team member. A liver transplant nurse might be more familiar with hepatitis B, so their education may differ from a kidney transplant nurse that could be less familiar. It's quite challenging to discuss and educate patients, but even more difficult if you try to do this right before or the last minute before the organ offer. Programs must um, figure out and develop a process to routinely discuss and educate with the patient before listing, at the time of listing, while on the wait list, at the time of organ offer. But really, the education doesn't have an end, right? There isn't a cure, so you have to continue it through all phases, and you want to make sure that education is ongoing and continuous. Thinking about team consensus and support, it's important to begin by getting the key stakeholders to the table to discuss and evaluate the safety and efficacy of such an approach. You want to review the data, including the current policies. There are multiple OPTM policies related to risk of transmissible disease, as well as strategies to minimize risk. You want to determine if this practice could be feasible within your program. So how, do you con how would you incorporate into your standard of care practice? Um, what does it look like? Is it possible to do this? And determining it is, you would then have to develop a standard process. And this process should be very detailed, and it should describe exactly what the practice looks like within your program and how it will be carried out throughout the course, right, from the beginning to the end. In addition to defining and describing in detail, you want to make sure you define the responsibility. So who is going to carry out these various processes across time? I think it's important to use these policies, procedures, and regulations, those pertaining to transplant as well as to your own um, programs and institutions um, as a starting point, but realize it's just the minimum. Your actual process is going to have to be refined, many, be refined many times to achieve the desired or the optimal clinical practice for your program. Lastly, defining metrics that allows your uh, practice to be evaluated is another strategy to obtain team consensus and support in the beginning, as well as to keep their support over time. So you want metrics that will tell you, is this new process um, effective? Is it successful? And what metrics would you use to determine that it has failed? Appropriate informed consent can be realized once everyone is educated and has an understanding about hepatitis B. This slide is just to summarize some key components to consider and include in the informed consent, and it was, it was adapted from an article um, published related to the utilization of hepatitis C organs. The recipients should expect that hepatitis B infection will be transmitted from the donor. The informed consent should provide details related to hepatitis B specific therapy and laboratory testing. The recipient or the patient should acknowledge that although there is a risk, it is low of transmission and the lack of long-term outcome data. And I, I, didn't, I didn't mention, but with the risk of transmission, it's to the intimate contacts is, is this part that you want to include in the consent. And additionally, as with other informed consents, you want to provide information on the benefits of these organs, as well as the other options if they do not wish to accept Hep, hep B by remake um, organ. Another thing in terms of clinical practice to consider um, are details related to recipient management. Um, these details and the management plans should be described within a program specific protocol, which in this setting is quite challenging compared to what we just heard with the uh, presenters about hepatitis C. And it's challenging in that, um, as we've heard, the pharmacotherapy is really um, targeting suppression. There's no cure, so it's long-term management. Without consensus recommendations, the optimal approach is unknown. 
Therefore, management relies heavily on this monitoring or this long-term monitoring with the resultant data of the monitoring being used to guide clinical decision-making over time. There are many components to consider relating to monitoring with just a few examples I have listed here. Surgical testing to assess the hepatitis B status and liver function of the recipient should occur at, at set intervals over the course of post-transplant. Ideally, um, your protocol should have an algorithm so that this data can be used to individualize the recipient's course in a systematic manner. Commonly, um, adverse events associated with the long-term use of oral therapies are mild, including headache, fatigue, nausea, and really don't usually lead to therapy discontinuation. However, efforts should include frequent review of such symptoms to help minimize the severity and allow targeted, targeted interventions if indicated. One of the things to consider is if prescribing one of the antivirals to prescribe the newest formulation, the tenofovir alafenamide or CAF, um, and due to, this, due to its stability, it allows lower dose to be used with a similar antiviral activity with less systemic exposure. So this is thought to decrease the renal and bone toxicity. For us in our program, I think it's useful to use some of this monitoring data as your clinical practice tool. Um, to really use it to educate the patient and share with them over time. It'll let them realize what their course is specifically related to hepatitis B, and also it provides an opportunity to demonstrate the importance and the need for this ongoing adherence to maintain adherence to the prescribed monitoring as well as therapy. This is just one example. This is very busy. Um, this is the protocol that was included in um, the paper that um, Emily per talked about earlier in the annals um, that we did here in University of Cincinnati. Um, this is just to illustrate that whatever protocol or whatever monitoring you do, of course, you need to design it such that it fits your program and that your team will use it. As I said, this is busy. It can be confusing. When we initially started this practice, we just had a protocol with the Hep B discordant population, so um, similar to the box there in orange. And then we had a separate protocol for this. We had a separate protocol for surface antigen positive recipients that received a positive graft. Monitoring was in a different place. This was very confusing for the team and resulted in a lot of missed uh, monitoring and things like that. So as our team met and continued to review, um, it was identified that this needed to all be in one place. So this is how our team prefers it. It also allows for our quality program to perform audits um, on this data to make sure the monitoring is, is it collected at the appropriate time point. So again, it needs to be designed for your team, else it's, it's not gonna be used by your team. Also with management in terms of duration, as, as expected, there's no consensus on the optimal duration and especially no consensus in the chronic immunosuppressed population. Um, it also is likely to vary based on organ type. And it may be possible to employ preemptive um, in certain situations, especially if you're able to get adequate and reliable um, laboratory monitoring over time. And finally, related to recipient management, as with anything with our patients, is to um, identify ways to um, determine what barriers are for patients and strategies to overcome. Um, there are many barriers related here, which we can talk about um, and answer questions in the discussion session. But again, I think ongoing education can really help um, address a lot of the barriers that you may encounter. As we saw with the um, hepatitis C section, a multidisciplinary approach to something like this in this practice style is, is, is absolutely necessary, um, including transplant surgery, medicine, as well as a Hep C or a Hep B expert. Um, I think the expert is especially important um, in a non-liver population. Um, our renal team, for example, has less experience with hepatitis B and actually refers um, the patients, recipients of these organs, to a hepatologist to help manage the Hep B component also pharmacy necessary, as we heard prior. One thing I think is key to also include here is due to the long duration of um, the, the infection is really the impact of the post team. Um, for us, it's our transplant nurse coordinators and our, our post-transplant medical assistants 
they're really the key players of our team that implement the protocols and make sure the monitoring is carried out. And of course, administration and in this context, um, thinking more than just the volume of transplants and finances and outcomes, but really administration to appreciate the complexity and the long term so that appropriate resources are provided to um, do the work that you've um, put together in your protocol. Very briefly, I know we went through lots of strategies, um, but this is just a list of summarizing some of those that we that I attempted to highlight. And lastly, I think um, the success for this approach is really dependent on continued progress or continued evolution related to the use of hep C or hep B, I'm sorry, viremic organs as an option to expand the donor pool with realization that hep B um, as a DNA virus is much like CMV, it imposes a risk of de novo infection to the uh, recipient. Current therapies for hepatitis B do offer suppression, but it's not a cure and it's lifelong. So further, further studies are needed to evaluate the long-term outcomes, potential risks of cirrhosis and or um, hepatocellular carcinoma, and ultimately to discover new therapies that are curative and then give a finite endpoint for the impact of um, the use of these organs and on the recipients long term. So now I'm going to turn it over to the moderators. And before I do, I would like to um, thank, on behalf of myself and my co presenters, the organizers for the opportunity to participate in the session today. Thank you. Thank you so much for four wonderful talks. And we'll quickly move into the question and answer session. We have about five minutes for hepatitis C and five minutes for hepatitis B. So we'll keep um, the discussion a little bit brief um, if, if possible, but so we can get through a lot of these interesting questions. First, I think we'll start with hep C for the first five minutes. Um, the first question is about does donor um, hep C viral load matter? And is it does it matter if, it, if you're hep C nat positive versus EIA positive? I think this question was meant for Dr. Woolley. Sure, yes. Yeah. So I definitely think the quantitative viral load very much matters. And that is why and I think Dr. Yukubu mentioned this in terms of the Toronto uh, one week or eight day treatment strategy and probably what he has seen in his study and what we have seen in our study is that it really it is all dependent on that. And what I think is the most interesting part about all of um, the studies that um, I've been able to be part of is seeing how directly proportional the recipient viral load at the initial time zero is to the donor viral load. And that's why when we're talking about what the rates of transmission are, they really have to be taken into that context. We know that many of our donors that are not positive have an exceedingly low viral load. And so it's not just, the, it's not always because of our treatment strategy of what we're doing, but it's more to do with that. We know we don't get quantitative viral loads um, that OPOs don't do that routinely. We do get that. We, re we request that and do that in, in our own OPO and we request it for our center. because I do think it's very informative in terms of doing for our center, um, our current study is under a two week treatment protocol compared to a four week treatment protocol because we believe that there should be no failures. I think Think that that any risk of resistance or anything with that in a situation where we can actually eradicate this has to be taken into account with that. And so while I think it matters, I also want to be careful to end on saying you don't need it, however. And that's why I think when we're trying to develop generalizable approaches, we have to do it assuming the viral load is high enough that we then have an approach that would work for all. Great. Yeah, thank you for that great answer. So our next question looks like it's directed at Dr. Yakubu. So for the pre-transplant dosing of SOFVEL, how is this supply obtained? And does your hospital have supply on hand? And what are those cost implications? Yeah, so uh, DAs in general are restricted uh, at our institution. Uh, but once we implemented the B standard of care, one of the things that we did, we went to the PNT committee uh, to make an exception for patients that are receiving hep C positive kidneys uh, to make it um, to allow for these patients to, to receive those agents. Uh, one of the things that we did was providing education to nurses in the oral, uh, within uh, the, um, in the oral setting, but also in the, uh, the transplant units to 
um, really understand the, the essence of that pre-transplant dose and uh, to ensure that this patient received that pre-transplant dose. Uh, we've also stocked a small supply of uh, Sovvel in the PIXIS in the oral pharmacy and also in uh, the uh, transplant unit uh, to ensure that, when, for example, if, if a patient, uh, if an offer becomes available overnight, that you know the nurses will have access to, to, to those agents. Um, it does come with a cost implication. I think, again, we've emphasized the importance of having uh, administrative support um, once we, uh, you know, um, move this to become standard of care, uh, the transplant administrator understood that it was going to eat into the uh, transplant DROG, uh, but we felt this was an innovative practice that was going to perhaps um, offer uh, more patients um, access to transplant, and we received that trans uh, that support from uh, the transplant administrators, but also from the pharmacy administrators. And uh, again, we're a 340B institution, and I think if your institution is a 340B institution, uh, the cost uh, implications Applications may not be as uh, as high, uh, but again, that's something something to consider as well. Great, thank you so much. And our last section on Hep C, I think, has a lot about resistance. And with a nearly fifty percent resistance rate in breakthrough infections, do you consent patients for that? And then, if they are, are there patients who fail to clear with retreatment? Do you test for resistance prior to retreatment? And are the and are there treatment emergent resistant mu mutations? Somebody else asks as well. So I don't know if Dr. Yakubu or Dr. Woolley, are you on mute? Looks like you're on mute right now. Shall we move to Hep B and then we can we can um, uh, come back to this answer once you're able to. I apologize. I, oh, had, I was having issues with my mouse. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, we do include the risk of potential um, uh, resistance in our consent. Um, and we've oh, we had one patient who had uh, persistent viremia um, despite multiple agents, but all of our patients who had viremia have had uh, clearance of the virus. Uh, they all responded to treatment. We only had one patient in our initial cohort who had persistent viremia uh, despite treatment with multiple agents. And again, we do consult hepatology um, that to assist with the management of these patients. So we have a, an HCV expert that's really focused on managing these patients and following, following up with these patients. Great. Shall we move to Hep B? Go ahead, Hannah. Yeah, so we have a couple questions in relation to the Hep B surface antibody titer. Um, and so one of them is in relation to how often we will need to actually check and then kind of in pair with that, how, what is the optimal level of that titer to be? Some of the centers are mentioning greater than 10 or 10 to 100, greater than 100. So what would that optimally be? So I can, I can address this first and then Tiffany, if you have any other thoughts, please feel free to jump in. So. I think we're still waiting. So this is a really kind of nascent field in terms of transplanting happy positive organs, right? So I showed you pretty much all the data that we have and that's, it's great, but it's just, it's not a lot. And so in terms of how often do we need to check these titers pre-transplant? I don't really know. Um, I think as long as you are somewhat close to when this patient is, is, you know, when you're working them up, when you're listing that patient, I think that would be a good time. Obviously you want to optimize this patient as much as you can in the pre-transplant uh, workup phase. So getting them all of their vaccinations, not just hep B, but all vaccinations. It's kind of a plug for that right now. Um, and then in terms of the titer, so, you know, there's no hard and fast rule about kind of less than 10, 10 to 100, greater than 100. And this is, there's not a whole lot of evidence to back this up. This is just kind of one potential way to think about it. How can we boost these patients? How can we get them through transplant safely when we're giving them uh, a virus that we know will live in them forever? Um, and so I think I think more to come on that, hopefully, as more centers start to feel more comfortable doing this, and hopefully we can really hammer out some protocols that would that everyone would really feel more comfortable with. Okay. Yeah, um, I concur. I don't. There's not really a lot, and like you said, this is so new. We don't have a lot of data to guide us. Yeah, that's very important on optimizing vaccination. And then um, is there data on transmission with the approach that you um, presented, you know, the, you sort of had a three-pronged approach that you presented, uh, Dr. Eichenberger and how? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I don't have data on actual transmission. So from, from that particular approach, from the literature, so for example, from that study that Delman and, and, and colleagues and Tiffany had, had contributed to, so, so for the livers, there were, 20, I think, 24% um, developed a hep B service antigen that became positive after transplant, and then almost 50% uh, zero converted their hep B court antibody. I think we have to assume that these patients will get the virus when we transplant the organ. So we just must assume that transmission is occurring. And for that reason that, that we, Tiffany and I kind of laid out, I think it's it's really important to be treating these patients with antivirals um, immediately after, after transplant, um, because you must presume that you are transmitting the virus. Dr. Kaiser, anything to add? Okay. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for one last question, um, but do we have data on number of uh, underutilized or unutilized organs that are HPV not positive for lung transplants specifically? No, I can only uh, kind of extrapolate from the data that's been published so far. Um, for example, in that AJT paper, um, looking at liver service antigen positive livers that we utilized and uh, versus not utilized. And so I presume that a similar number of, of lungs, although I can't say whether they were not utilized because of hep B surface antigen positive or if there were other kind of donor quality issues there. Um, but I, I presume that quite a few have, have not been used for that reason based on the data we have. Great. Um, I'd like to ask them, um, the organizers if we can continue or do is there a hard stop at one? If we can keep going, I'll, I'll keep going. There's several questions in the, in the chat as well. Um, for heart and lung transplant patients, we use pretreatment hep C strategy um, and uh, you know, exclusively Maverick followed by 28 days therapy post-op. Um, so they've talked about shorter course, so, so um, I guess, uh, but now resistance data makes them worried. So uh, I guess there's, it's not a specific question. Um, maybe on hep B, do you treat with entecavir lifelong? Dr. Kaiser or Dr. Eichenberger? Um, so for us at Hep B, um, if it's a liver patient, tenofovir is our preferred agent, but we do use entecavir if we are unable to use or obtain tenofovir, and we do treat, we do do it lifelong. Um, there are potential scenarios that you may be able to stop if you could monitor, have a specific antibody titer that you your center determined was, was adequate, whatever that level may be. However, we've run into situations where um, you have logistical issues, right? And obtaining labs, getting labs, labs are canceled, they're not done in time and things like that. So yes, we've kept it long-term. On the kidney side, we do it for about one year and, and still implement monitoring. Um, again, yeah. there are lots of logistical concerns and questions with the monitoring aspect of, of the length of therapy for us. Emily, anything more? No, I 100% agree with that statement. Okay, great, thank you so much. I think we do need to wrap up at this time. Thank you to um, all the four wonderful speakers and very, very informative webinar. Thanks to all of our um, listeners and for all your questions and engagement. And we can, do, uh, we can definitely follow up on some of these questions that we didn't get to, but I think we got to almost all of the topics people asked about. So thank you so much. And uh, I'll hand it over to Hannah to wrap up and thank the speakers as well. Yeah, thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to engage with the discussion and then you know ask questions that are really meaningful for everyone's practice. So have a good rest of your afternoon, everyone. At this time, AST would like to thank our panelists and attendees for today's session. And please remember to complete the evaluation survey, which we have also posted in the chat section. Thank you again.